Okay, we're here at ANU today discussing a new report that's come out from The Lancet, the highly prestigious medical journal about environmental health. And uh, they commissioned 60 scientists to study the effects of the environment, uh, changes that we're seeing on health, and we have uh, a wonderful panel with us here today to discuss that. We have uh, Archie Clements, the Director of the Research School of Population Health. We have uh, Jeanette Lindsay, the Deputy Director of the Fenner School of Environment and Society. We have Liz Hanna, also from the Research School of Population Health, and Mark Howden, the Director of the Climate Change Institute at ANU. Uh, so uh, I'll perhaps start with Liz because uh, you were the uh, Director of the Climate Change Adaptation Network. Um, to tell us a little bit about what this report means for the world. Um, thanks. Yes, it's uh, th they put out a report in 2009, which was absolutely groundbreaking. This was the first time that um, something as prestigious as the Lancet drew attention to the world that climate change is a human health issue. And in that report, they were mainly highlighting all the specific health risks and how that how climate change was going to sort of manifest in, into health problems. Um, and so some years later, now it's 2015, the new report has, um, um, has been released. And what they're showing there is that, A, very concerned that the projections of health outcomes are much more severe and are occurring much sooner than they possibly imagined. Um, and this time, rather than only focusing on these are the health risks and these are the health outcomes that are likely to happen, it's what are we going to do about it? So they're moving very much forward to um, suggesting solutions and trying to actually get across into people's minds that if we actually do the serious mitigation and we actually sort of follow a pro-health approach to all this, we mm. actually get um, coincidental health improvements. So it ends up being very cost, you know, cost effective mm. so um, uh, and it uh, saves a lot of health. Are we in what are some of the dangers that we're seeing? What have they outlined? Just tops of the waves. Um, tops of the waves are the main ones. Uh, of course, the heat deaths, um, uh, changes to changes to agriculture, um, changes to storms and floods and and indeed fires, mm -hmm. uh, and all the ramifications that that has. Mm -hmm. um, except that they're 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 more frequent and they're more intense even in that short time frame. Mm. Okay, so moving to Mark. Agricultural uh, adaptation is your field. Um, what do you read from this report? I guess uh, we start from a point where Australian farmers and businesses across the value chain are already well adapted to climate variability, so they've dealt with past variability quite well. Uh, but what is we're finding is that they're becoming increasingly stressed because the conditions they find themselves in now are beyond the historical experience and so they haven't necessarily got adaptive strategies for the things that are happening now and so one of the things that this results in is a significant psychological stress as well as financial stress and also can stress the natural resource base on which future production is, is dependent and so sort of once you start to look at this and start to think we need new adaptive systems then you can also get those sorts of co-benefits that Liz has mm -hmm. talked about in health uh, but in agriculture about um, how to maintain production in more difficult times and so we have technologies to do that nowadays mm -hmm. um, how to maintain the viability of rural communities when they're under stress. Uh, they're very fragile, aren't they? They can be, when because they're very highly dependent on the money flows from the farming community that surrounds them. And so when that uh, farming community is, is in stress themselves, there, there yeah. is no money flow and, the, and the, uh, yeah. the townships also suffer. And it's, and it's not just an economic suffering from what I'm hearing, is it? It actually moves to a psychological burden on the community? Indeed, and so various surveys and studies have shown that, that a lot of Australian farmers are already feeling very stressed, very disempowered, uh, and so they're not able to control their futures, and climate is part of that. And so in those circumstances, they can actually go into a state of denial uh, where they start to um, omit um, imp strategically important things, and that actually increases their vulnerability in the long term. So um, when we do those studies, we actually find those farmers who are more cognizant of the accumulating risks, including climate, uh, they actually feel empowered um, in terms of their own future and they actually feel a lot happier. And so, so there are psychological uh, stresses and ways of managing those stresses. So are we well placed to, to meet some of these challenges coming on from an agricultural point of view? 
Uh, yes and no, I think. Um, so some of these these are, are difficult issues. As I mentioned before, there's uh, relationships between stress and and climate factors. So <clears throat> work here at ANU showed that uh, as drought stress increased, uh, suicide rates of, of males in rural communities increased significantly. <coughs> and so, um, so that's a, a very difficult topic for um, farming communities to deal with. Uh, but it also tells you something which is really important, that there are particular times, there's particular gender groups and there's particular age groups that you can actually target for counselling. Mm. And so from a policy response, it actually says you can use your money very efficiently to actually target those those groups. And so, so there's some good news that actually comes out of mm. understanding what's going on in terms of uh, the relationship between climate stress and farming communities. Mm. Mm. So Archie, as we see agricultural um, conditions changing, um, that's the kind of area that you study in sort of global health and uh, environments. What do you see coming from this report? Um, well, firstly, I think that this is, um, I, I fully endorse this report. I think it's a, um, it's a holistic uh, um, look at the problem of climate change uh, from the perspective of health. And I think, as Liz mentioned, the health <coughs> effects of climate change, I think, are a really compelling argument um, for, for the Australian government, for Australian, the Australian public, for the global community to, to really take this problem seriously and, uh, and, and, and deal with the issues that, that, are, that are leading to climate change. Um, the, the health effects of climate change are, are very diverse. They come from the direct effects of heat. Uh, for example, at the moment, uh, and in recent uh, weeks and months, we've, we've seen uh, serious heat waves uh, impacting in the Indian subcontinent that have resulted in large numbers of deaths. Um, <clears throat> and um, also uh, events such as uh, cyclones and flooding. Uh, I lived in Brisbane during the uh, recent um, flooding event, which um, tragically resulted in a loss of life, but also was um, extremely disruptive to the, the to the Queensland economy. And uh, those types of uh, natural events, uh, which are directly related to climate change, are, are part of the, of the health picture associated with climate change. <coughs> But there's also then the impact, as you say, on food production uh, and on, uh, on security and, and stability, geopolitical stability. And the, those problems that are associated with climate change undermine health systems and um, undermine the, uh, the, the capacity of countries to deal with public health problems. Yeah. And from my perspective, I think that's actually probably the biggest <coughs> climate change related um, impact on health. It won't be so much through, uh, say, for example, changing uh, weather patterns, uh, increased warming and, uh, and, and um, increased rainfall, uh, for example, in, in northern Australia. It'll be more through the undermining of, of, of health systems and the ability of countries to actually provide health care to their citizens. And um, So are you saying there might be a, a, a change in the, in the health um, patterns of an outbreak of some unusual disease, and they just don't have the capacity. So the disease outbreaks are part of the uh, part of the story. Yes. So um, <clears throat> if countries, particularly countries in our region, um, if their capacity to deal with um, major infectious disease outbreaks is limited by um, the need to divert resources to food production, the um, instability, the geopolitical instability that's created through natural disasters, through food uh, scarcity. Um, that will then impact on, 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 on the, um, the ability of countries to deal with emerging threats like infectious diseases, like SARS, like influenza. And that creates a biosecurity risk for Australia in our region. And, and I think that's really where the, the, the big public health impact of climate change will be mm. for us, from a, um, particularly if we're thinking about infectious diseases. It won't be so much because of uh, diseases like dengue moving south from Cairns mm. down through um, Brisbane and into New South Wales, for example. Similar to the situation around agriculture, Australia is in a relatively strong position. We have a strong health system where um, we'll be able to adapt um, to those types of challenges. But the health and biosecurity of Australia is intimately linked with the health, with the health and biosecurity of, of our region. And countries like Indonesia, like PNG, like um, the Philippines, dealing with natural disasters with health systems that are not as strong as ours um, will mean that um, diseases like dengue like um, malaria, like influenza, will um, will be much harder to deal with, and, and Australians will be will be at risk through 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 our through our links in, in the region, through our through our tourism, mm -hmm. through our through our um, 
economic links, and, and I think that's where the real problem will be. Mm. And if, if I may, just on, on that point, Archie, the, uh, like for example, Cyclone Pam that went through, uh, went through Vanuatu, um, almost all the schools were flattened or damaged. Mm. You know, so, I mean, the health buildings, you know, the, the infrastructure, mm. once you wipe that out, it's very difficult for any system to operate, and hence the fact that then, you know, all, all the development that they'd actually had, mm. many, many years of progress towards the millennium, millennium, millennium development goals, yep. uh, reversed in an instant. Oh. Um, and it's very, very hard, mm. and this is why they're much li more likely to get outbreaks, which, of course, spread around the, the region. And, and Philippines, they get hammered on a regular basis. And mm. if you think of it in terms of... You know, they struggle, they try to, you know, improve their systems, get things working, you know, set up, um, uh, you know, safety zones, etc. Along comes another, another typhoon coming through. It knocks the country down. Mm. Um, and, you know, the people, they, uh, I mean, there's, there's um, interruptions in the, again, in their food supply. So you get more stunting and, and uh, less lowered resilience in terms of their ability to withstand diarrhea and, and infectious diseases. Uh, and then to start to build themselves up again, then comes another one. Mm. And so you know, it's it's very easy to imagine a scenario where they just constantly, mm. you know, just get worn and worn down. And, yes. and you know, hence the absolute uh, necessity for, for certainly, pa um, you know, strong mitigation efforts, but also an awareness to to the global health risks and indeed to, to security, mm. um, you know, in many forms, because, it, you know, a standard thing that people have done historically, of course, is um, if their world goes belly up, they try to move. Oh. Um, and it's understandable. They yeah. want to feed their families. They must feed their families if they can. Um, and so there'll be, you know, many people looking for somewhere to live. Mm. So we're going to see a lot of displaced oh. refugees. And it's not mm. just a matter of we will see, we actually are seeing, oh, really? uh, we are mm. seeing this already. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a public health um, challenge that we're facing now, which is a direct result of climate change, a direct result of our inability to deal with, mm. um, uh, with, with carbon emissions. And, and, um, and, and we're seeing the health effects mm. now. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. Of course it will happen in the future, it'll be much worse in the future, mm -hmm. but it's happening now. And, and the evidence presented in this report is compelling that it's happening now. Mm. And Australia can't sit here and think we're safe mm. you know, and we can have, you know, borders, mm. you know, that actually protect protect us from all the nastiness that's happening out yeah. there. It's, uh, you know, we are a sort of, you know, big global community. Yeah. And, mm. and as Archie said, it's, it is happening now. So, for example, to our north, there's already some islands which have been depopulated because of sea level rise. That's the Carteret Islands. And mm. so um, mm. this is not a future scenario. This is yeah. a present scenario, although that wasn't done for health reasons. Even if we did try to seal our our borders, mm. we're still within Australia, Jeanette, seeing things happening, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so what what we're seeing in Australia is what we're seeing in many other parts of the world that temperatures are, are rising. Um, they have been doing all through the last century and into this one. And what's really concerning is that the rates of change are increasing. And that's not only happening elsewhere, mm. places like the Arctic, where you see it very clearly with mm. the ice melt. Yep. But right here in Australia, we're seeing that in recent years, uh, we've had a massive increase in the air, land area of Australia affected by high temperatures in the summer, mm. for instance. Uh, and that's very marked. Mm. and quite distinctive and together with the rising temperatures and the increased incidence of heat wave events for example mm. which have severe impacts on on health and lead to excess <coughs> deaths and that sort of thing um, we're seeing that rainfall is decreasing in eastern australia and has mm. decreased quite substantially in some areas and in the southwest in wa for instance mm. um, but it's increasing in the northwest so mm. we're getting hotter drier conditions in many areas and hotter wetter conditions mm. in others and it's all quite complex to deal with and has big impacts on water supplies and food production. And, and is that where the risks are for us? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and those risks come from the individual extreme events, mm. uh, such as the heat wave or the flood uh, mm. or the big storm, but they also come from the slow onset events like droughts, mm -hmm. um, which are not quite so dramatic perhaps because they mm. don't happen quickly, mm. but they have very serious consequences for us. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, the uh, sort of very large bushfires that we've been seeing in recent years, such mm. as the Black Saturday fires outside Melbourne, those sorts of fires with big extent and very high severity, very difficult to control, are much more likely when you've got a hotter environment mm. and one that's drier overall, because those are the kinds of conditions mm. where if you get a fire ignition, it yep. becomes very difficult to control 
those those particular circumstances. Yeah. So so we're at risk not only from the sort of the broader the population <coughs> the epidemiologists here who study large populations are seeing things changing but also the, yeah. the sort of extreme event the, the that's going to be a one off two off five yes. off 10 off um, you know it's becoming a regular is well well that's the thing so the frequency yeah. uh, as we as we've moved through this warming period that we've had already and as we go into the future mm. the return period of these extreme events decreases substantially right. uh, so what we're seeing is that one in 20 year events that we have presently so where you might get a, a, a heat wave occurring of, of a particular magnitude say or right. a particular size of flood that currently would happen maybe once every 20 years or once every 50 years those periods become halved or even smaller mm. so that the one in 20 year event by 2030 2050 becomes a one in two or three year event mm. and that's something that we're just not equipped to deal with at the mm. moment yeah what what can our children expect Hmm. Well, that's, that's it. I mean, one of the <coughs> things, of course, is that a child born today, by the time they're 32 years old, the weather extremes that we're seeing now today in 2015 um, is, is going to be the norm for them. And so it's, you know, it's very difficult to imagine what their extreme weather will be if that's another order of magnitude or, or <coughs> more um, over and above what we have. And, and as far as heat is concerned, it's... We have a, a thermoregulatory limit. You know, we need mm. to keep our, t our core temperature, you know, around about 37 degrees. Mm. Now, because our muscles, 80% of the energy produced by our muscles is heat, we have to shed that to the environment. It's very mm. difficult to do that when it's hot and humid, but it's increasingly difficult to do it when it's over about um, 35. In fact, your peak muscular performance actually works at about, if the ambient temperature is around 11 or 12 degrees <laughs> and so you know people are having to go out shopping they're having to climb up telephone poles bowls and and you know look after the sheep and and accident and emergency and mm. district nurses and all those people yeah. you know very important tasks that they're doing to keep the you know, community safe and alive yeah. <coughs> and if they're pardon me if they're finding it difficult to go out and uh, go out and function mm. then society as, as a whole um, comes out and, and once we get up to the you know over 35 and, <coughs> 30 and dare I say 45 degrees um, it's it's it it restricts life. Yeah. It restricts society's function. Um, one of the things you you <coughs> mentioned at the beginning is that this actually has given us somewhere to go. It's given us some positives mm. to work with. Um, so what are those positives that it's given us? So the document it's a very positive document. It does outline mm. a number of strategies that um, that that we can adopt. Um, I mean the obvious one is that we need to uh, reduce carbon emissions. So we need mm -hmm. to um, stop burning coal and we need to invest more in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. um, now as a population health specialist, have you seen from the in huge incidence of wind farms being coming up that there's any health effects? Um, so I think it's a nonsense to suggest that wind farms actually create major health effects um, or that there are major health consequences of, for, the, for, the, um, for the construction of, of wind farms and if you compare um, even a minuscule health impact of, of, of wind farms with the massive health impact which is documented in this report from the burning of coal, um, there is no way that they can be considered on, on an equivalent basis. In fact, I think it's, um, it's really tr diverting attention from the real issue and um, uh, if we talk about health effects of wind farms, what we really should be talking about is the health, health effects of climate change that are driven by the burning of coal. Mm. <coughs> but this um, document takes a, a holistic approach, so it doesn't just talk about the, um, the need to reduce um, consumption of coal and the need to invest in renewable energy. It also talks about the types of things that we can do to, to improve health in parallel with that. So it, and it takes a, a, um, a multi-sectoral view. So it looks at, um, it suggests that we need to do things like uh, strengthen health systems, particularly in, in developing countries, um, where much of the health burden of um, climate change is going to um, occur, at mm -hmm. least initially. Um, it talks about investing in, in, in research, uh, public health research, um, to work out ways that we can actually mit mitigate the impact of climate change. <coughs> um, it talks about the provision of um, water and sanitation. Uh, it talks about um, uh, looking at nutrition and, and, and the way that we can um, uh, look at, uh, work with um, the agricultural sector and food production in order to mitigate the, the um, nutritional effects of, of climate change. Uh, and it talks about the built environment, how we can build our cities um, more, um, so, that, um, so that we can lead healthier lives and, 
and, and uh, thereby mitigate some of the effects of climate change. Because mm. <coughs> it, 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 part of that is, is um, uh, trying to promote more active living mm. and mm. active transport. And uh, there's a, a slide I tend to use in my presentations. There's a, an inverse relationship between a national obesity and proportion of transport trips that are done either by foot or, foot or bicycle, mm -hmm. uh, when you compare country by country by country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. And of course, once you get people out, uh, either walking the streets or indeed, you know, bicycling around, um, there's much more community engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the air is cleaner because you're not having all the pollution coming out of the cars, they're fitter, you know, it it's mm -hmm. improves diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the, you know, the benefits are astronomical. And I think one of the, um, one of the other uh, uh, figures that was uh, published in this report and has been released earlier is that annually, the ignoring the health costs from the fossil fuel industry is effectively a subsidy to the point of $5.3 trillion globally annually. Mm which is a huge figure. And the, with the Climate and Health Alliance that I'm, um, I'm president of, we commissioned a report last year to examine the health costs of the coal hunter, uh, the hunter coal alone. <coughs> um, and that's, um, uh, that's a cost of $600 million per annum just in that region in terms of health mm. costs. Um, and that's, you know, that's What kind of things does that manifest as? It's, it's largely respiratory, yeah. uh, respiratory and cardiovascular. Um, and if you incorporate, if you take a more broad view and think of the social costs that go along with that, um, that's up to a uh, uh, billion dollars, um, six mm. billion dollars per annum. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the figures are enormous. So, mm. you know, it's, it, it makes economic sense yeah. for us to get ourselves off, yeah. off fossil fuels and, uh, and towards the renewables and active transport. Uh, the evidence is there, the World Bank, you know, World Health Organization, you know, it's not as if it's sort of, you know, far-flung and, and mm. you know, freaky, freaky evidence here. It's, you know, the major organisations that are, you know, really solid economic bases mm. um, have provided the evidence. So it's, mm. it's lunacy for the Australian government not to keep pushing this really, mm. uh, really hard. And we would like them to, um, to take it up. So in terms of uh, food security and water security, <coughs> is, is that <coughs> another issue that comes out of this? Yes. Yes, I mean, again, most of this would come from mm. um, uh, the changes in, <coughs> you know, changes in supply, which, of course, will be mm. rainfall yeah. um, and evaporation. And uh, as far as food security <coughs> is concerned, I mean, everything that Marcus said obviously is true. But there's the other issue that people tend not to think of, and that's that plants have an upper temperature tolerance as well. Mm. They don't do well. And, and if you, you know, drive around some of those areas, you see uh, vineyards now wearing little shower caps up and down the you know, mm. on top of them to keep the, mm. um, the heat off. You know, they w literally wither on the vine and, and mm. the, you know, fruit and vegetables suffer. Wheat is enormously sensitive. Mm. So it's not, you know, I mean, this, is, this is what's going to lower the yields and therefore interrupt people's nutritional levels and, of course, their mm. economics and round and round it goes. Mm. So it's, you know, there's upper temperature thresholds for mm. all of us and we're, we're heating, heating those more frequently, um, more se uh, severely. And if it hits a plant at a critical stage of its growth, you can lose the whole the whole year's crop. Mm. Um, and yeah, so there's how are we positioned with that mark to go forward. Do you think? Well, there's a as I mentioned before, there's a huge amount of capacity to adapt uh, agriculture in Australia and and elsewhere. And Australia, in many ways, has been world leading in that in the past. Um, the challenge is that as these changes continue, and it's not just climate change, but many other changes, uh, that we we need to be able to be continue to be innovative and and uh, keep ahead of the game, because uh, otherwise Australia we've got a, a difficult farming environment. You mm -hmm. know, we will drop behind. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge in Australia and globally is that the research and development for agriculture and agriculture and environment uh, is actually reducing. Uh, and there's a, a, a relationship which shows that when you start to reduce your research and development, you uh, forego future um, growth in productivity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that um, reduction in R&D now uh, may not cut in for some years, but when it cuts in, it actually lasts mm -hmm. for a long time. So, so, so there is a R&D challenge, uh, which goes well beyond the issue of climate change. But there is a, also a, just following on from what Liz says, there's actually um, uh, some, some specific links between what we're seeing with climate and health issues. So, for example, uh, Aust Australia used to be a net 
exporter mm -hmm. uh, in commodities like vegetables and fruit. Um, and because of climate and price factors as well, uh, we've actually become net importers in terms of fruit mm -hmm. and vegetables. This is in terms of the value of the, of the imports versus exports. Uh, and this is exactly the same time we're actually being told we need to eat more fruit mm. and vegetables for, for health purposes, health benefits. And so uh, so that climate signal, which has actually turned us to, to be a, a net importer than an exporter, yeah. um, essentially makes us less self-sufficient in terms of these increasingly recognised critical mm. foods for good health. Wow. So been, what and I was just thinking, um, part of that, which I was done in Shepparton at the time, 2003 was a major hailstorm. Yeah. It took up the stone fruit. The major supermarkets mm. realised that they were vulnerable if the SPC region was wiped out in a major storm. Hence, they then decided to start outsourcing from other countries, um, which had, again, rural community problems for mm. the people in our, in our food bowl. Um, and so it therefore makes Australia more vulnerable to changes if we're needing our vital food sources um, dependent on, um, on, on the goodwill of other countries. Mm. And particularly for long-lived um, plants, also mm. industrial equipment. So if you if you knock out your uh, um, orchards or your your vines or any other long long sort of standing uh, sort of crop, you know, perennial uh, nut tree, uh, it takes many years to actually get that back. Um, and also, if you take out your cannery or your mm. rice processing plant, mm. uh, effectively in the current economic environment, it just doesn't come back. And so. Um, mm. So you can very quickly ratchet down um, your ability to actually produce high value commodities and then that flows through to your um, local economy and, and all the stresses that occur from you know, sort of starting to be collapse of rural mm. uh, towns etc. Mm. So, um, so there's very, a lot of sort of flow on effects from uh, you know, what seem to be relatively minor climate signals as they start to be taken into account in, in terms of value chains. So, Someone, mm. yeah. Now, I'm just going to comment on water. Um, we've got such a good example of what can happen with water supplies with what's happened around Perth, for mm. instance. So, uh, Perth inflow into Perth water supply was at a particular level. In the mid 1970s, that abruptly changed, and this is very clearly attributable to climate change and yeah. changes in weather patterns and established a new level that was oh, not quite half of what it had been before. And then that has dropped again more recently. And the response, given a growing population and all the mining boom that we're all so familiar with and the changes that have happened there socially, has been, of course, that you need water, you've got to have water security. So they've been putting in desal, so desalinization. And that in itself is a, it's a solution. It gives you fresh water, but it takes a lot of energy to run them and you're producing fresh water but there's a lot of very saline byproduct mm. which then you have to dispose of and if you put that back into the ocean and you don't mix it well you're ending up with a high salinity layer in the ocean which is dead in terms of marine mm. productivity so there's all sorts of consequences mm. around this and we're seeing them right here yeah. in australia right now so with this report where would you like to see it go what, mm. what what's the effect you'd like to see it have one of the main things I'd like is um, I'd like this to be uh, broadly received mm -hmm. and read. Um, and if the Australian public, and it, we'd like it to get out far and wide, so if the Australian public were to, to become more fully aware of the impacts that it's having and the fact that there are solutions, mm -hmm. um, then I think we'd get a little bit more political pressure because, let's face it, the current policies are working in the exact opposite direction to what this report recommends. Um, and so that if the politicians realise that the people actually value their own future, they want, mm. they want their children to grow up and have a happy and healthy life much as we've enjoyed all our lives, then, um, then it would be good for the Australian government to recognise that we won't have a bar of it. You know, I mean, they can't trifle with our future. Mm. Any other comments? Um, well, I think, I think that the, um, the report is it's it's about the health impacts it's it's written by by medical professionals by doctors by public health um experts it's highly credible um and i i would love to see the government take this seriously i would love to see australia become a leader in uh, globally in dealing with the health impacts of climate change partly because of the moral obligation where we are <coughs> the, one of the biggest exporters of coal which is a, which is the main part of the problem additionally we've got a highly trained uh, work uh, health public health workforce we have some of the best health and medical research in the world happening in Australia. We need to take a lead uh, internationally um, 
uh, in, in, in generating research in supporting countries in our region to deal with the health impacts of climate change. I'd like to see more funding for health and medical research, um, particularly around global health, public health, and the health impacts of climate change. And I think this document's a really compelling, presents a really compelling argument for why Australia needs to show leadership in, 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 that, in that way. Sounds like a great place mm. to wind up.